Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome today to the seminar, Unlocking the Power of the Curb. Thank you for coming, and thank you also to Landor for organising it, well-known events organiser and publisher, and to Gred, our major sponsor for today. My name is John McArdle. I am immediate past president of the British Parking Association. I'm also chair of the London region. So a few of the examples you hear today will be from London and Eversbury because we often get things first. But certainly the ideas, the principles, the tricks and tips you get today will be applicable in any other urban area. They can, you can even use them in a one horse town. If that one horse town has one loading bay and a horse is tied up in it, stopping the brewery truck and then to service the local saloon. The, the, the speakers will be using a mixture of slides and direct talk to you. Slides will be available, and of course, a recording of the the whole event will be available later today. So keep an eye on the keep an eye on the your email messages, and we'll send that out to you when it's when it's ready for you. But you didn't come here today to listen to me. You came to listen to this excellent line of speakers. We've got Neil Heron and a, and a host of others, five in total, who are going to tell you about different aspects of the delivery challenges and a few solutions as well. I'll hand you over to Neil in a minute, and he will take you through handing over to the next one in a bit of a daisy chain, and then we'll go to questions. So don't forget, put your questions in. If you submit questions to us, we'll put them to the panel. We'll get you the answers. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Neil. Neil, take it away. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone, and uh, hope you enjoy our presentation and the discussion that will follow. Uh, I'd like today to introduce the dynamic digital curbside uh, as a new way of managing city curb space. Next slide, please. Well, first off, we need to look at the problem, and the problem is a big one. It's everywhere, it's around the world, and cities are growing. Uh, and in the UK, we're looking at 40,000 extra deaths that are attributable to uh, poor air quality. And the, the problem is forecast to get worse. Uh, worse and we've we've got to look at the problem in context and the, even if we look at the Inrix report yesterday which said that London is the most congested city in the world we need to now look at how we how we look at that curb look at the chaos that's at the curb and if we move on to the next slide we'll look at the problem that we do have with with the curb space and the the issues are, are great and you've got lots of competing actors wanting to play at the curb space from bus and cycle lanes COVID social distancing, we've got roadworks, we've got EV charging, we've got cycle hires, loading and unloading service vehicles, passenger pickup and drop off, as well as parking as well. And if we look at that, we wouldn't build an airport these days and just expect everybody to turn up as and when they wanted to and, and occupy that curb space for as long as they wanted. And what we're doing with the first come first serve, serve basis is creating chaos. And as that curb space diminishes and shrinks, then there is a requirement to bring order to that curb space. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll look at how we're proposing to do that. And what GRID's done, and it's taken us a long time to build to build the momentum for this, going back 10, 10 or more years, to look and understand the industry, to look and understand the sector, and look at the parking operators, the curbside management uh, behaviours of local authorities, and the operator needs. And what we're trying to do is to look at that curb space and say, right, we need a platform in the middle, to bring the curb owners and the curb users together in one place and look at how we bring order to that curb space and turning what is a, a two-dimensional piece of real estate into a three-dimensional dynamic and monetizable asset that can be managed and, and better ordered in a way that's a lot easier for everybody to understand. And if we move on to the next slide, we, we know and understand that the curb space, especially for commercial vehicles, is complex. Construction vehicles need different types of access to the curb as a parcel company, delivering parcels and dwell times of a few minutes at the curb. Children frozen foods bring their own sector specific problems. And brew logistics, as we'll hear uh, later on from John, have their, have their own real particular health and safety issues at the curb. Service and maintenance vehicles and telecoms all have a different requirement as well. And what we've got to look at is how the local authority is able to manage that and look at the nuanced behaviours of each one of those sectors and what their curbside needs are. And like John says, we can we can look at this for cities or for even a one-horse town where we've developed a solution that can be used um, in extremis or as a holistic solution to manage the curb space for commercial vehicle activity. And then we can address 
the issues which are air quality, the electrification and the transfer of vehicles or the, the moving across of vehicles from petrol and diesel into electric vehicles. And how do we do that? How do we place the infrastructure? How do we manage all this? It's a complex problem to get from where we are to net zero and better manage the curb space. But we believe that there's a solution out there to be able to do that. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll have a look at the, the issues which which come. And this is why we commissioned the Stantec report. We knew that it was a great idea. We're getting great feedback from local authorities, the operators from the parcel sector, the brew logistics, to frozen and chilled, and everybody else, and the construction sector, as we've worked on projects with Thames Tideway and HS2, know that this is a great solution, a potential solution, but we wanted validation from uh, a, a global transport infrastructure consultancy like Stantec to be able to say, well, we're saying it's great, but look at what the economic, environmental, and social benefits could be that would flow from this. So we've got a suite, a suite of four solutions, and just to describe them very, very briefly, the bookable permit bay is an obvious one, taking a loading bay from a first come, first serve basis to the ability to book the slot. And for operators, the guaranteeing of that slot means that you're not circling around looking for space. And we've integrated the, the smart sign, which you can see on the right hand side there, where we've got a regulatory plate and an information plate as well, which gives information to the local or the hyper local level as to what the bookings are that are taking place at that location. And if we move on to the next one, we've created the concept of a virtual loading bay as well. So virtual loading bays are areas where loading is normally prohibited, but we can look at the sector specific need and lift that restriction with a digital dispensation or waiver for a vehicle to be at that location. And it seems obvious it's, it's bringing order to that chaos at the curb space. And if we move on to the next slide, we look at some of the most obvious things that where well, loading is time limited, but vehicles have been encouraged to consolidate the loads. It doesn't make sense penalizing that vehicle for taking 60 minutes to unload when there's a 20 minute limit. Just allow the vehicles to book an extra delivery dwell time. And that means that there's no PCN issued, better management of the space, fewer vehicles because that consolidated load can bring more, more goods into the city. And it means that that congestion is removed or the, the reduction in congestion is, is, is a benefit for the highway and the, the operator as well as the curbside manager. If we move on to the next slide, looking at the behaviours of the likes of parcel cars, if they're doing 150 to 200 drops a day, they don't want to be booking individual slots. So we've developed a zonal permit, which allows operators to, to undergo certain observational protocols at the curbside. And by doing that, they're allowed dispensations to dwell longer if necessary. And by dwelling longer and doing more deliveries on foot, or transferring to porters or transferring to e-cargo bikes, then we're making a better use of the space and reducing the number of circling vehicles in the space. And if we move on to the next slide as well, the, the first question that we always get asked is, what if someone's parked there? So we've created the, the contingency provision. If someone comes along and there is a rogue vehicle, we're classed as a rogue vehicle, parked in the, in the location that's been booked, then we will spin up an alternative loading location or a virtual loading bay which the vehicle can be directed to, but at the same time is informing enforcement to be able to come off beat and ticket that vehicle. So we need to move towards a zero tolerance approach at the curbside to better manage and better enable all of this activity to take place. And if we can just imagine the world in the next slide, if what it could look like, the dynamic curb space, I, I think we'll move back one mark. There we are. If we, if we look at how we can better manage the curb space, we've just conducted a pilot in the Netherlands in, in the little city of Amersfoort, where in the morning we could allow a brewery delivery vehicle to load and unload right at the curb next to the cellar door. During the day, during the afternoon, we could have a parcel co in, integrating with an EV rapid charger. So those vehicles are effectively grazing across the network and that same space can then be repurposed on an evening to be a taxi charging bay and also a street, eatery, a street eatery where the local restaurant, as happened in the Netherlands, brought out the tables and chairs and started serving food and drink. And making that space more flexible, and like we said right at the very beginning, if the space is diminishing, it needs to be managed. And this is a common sense approach to how we manage curb space in the future. And if we move on to the next slide, the benefits. And what we're looking at is, we we identified the benefits and we need everybody to be winning in this in this game the commercial operator optimization of their behaviors reduction of pcn pcns and better management of their behaviors 
means that they have commercial efficiencies and beneficial efficiencies, which will save money. For the residents, you're getting reduced congestion, improved traffic management, better space management in the urban realm. And for the council, reduction of the CO2 emissions and de hits decarbonisation targets and a better managed curb space brings a, a promise of monetization of that curb space as well. And the environment, there are benefits for the environment. But with the Stantec report, if not, I'll now pass over to David, we'll see how we can quantify those benefits and look at the model that's being created to help articulate that, the qualitative and quantitative analysis of the, the outcomes. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, we just uh, move on to the next slide. So, yeah, hi, I'm David Bowes. As you can see, I'm a director of transport planning at Stantec. Some of you may know Stantec because it's previous incarnation as Peter Brett Associates. And I'm just going to talk uh, for a few minutes just about how we've attempted to assess the impacts of the proposed uh, curb products. So, if we just go to the next slide, you'll see a classic picture. This is in uh, Orworth Road in South London of uh, the challenges in urban areas of um, making deliveries to shops and how that impacts on traffic flows, bus flows, and also on pedestrians and cyclists. And I think the key point is that, as Neil said, curbside is it's actually a scarce resource and a better management of that resource can have lots of benefits because at the moment it sometimes can be difficult for vehicles to pull up where they want or when they want, and that leads to uh, parking in uh, locations which uh, don't help the wider environment and have a, a wider impact, not just on the uh, reduced performance of the delivery operators, but also on the operation of the road network. And also, and probably even more importantly, how the urban area feels and is, is used by uh, cyclists, pedestrians, people using the local shops. So what we did um, as part of our work is to look at the curb products and then to assess them like any other transport scheme using the transport the DFT's transport appraisal guidance. And that gives a very uh, rigorous and consistent approach to assess transport in interventions, whether that's uh, a new rail line or a rail station through to active travel measures or pedestrian facilities or cycle lanes. And we use the same process to look at if we were actually able to better manage uh, the curbside and the deliveries to ensure that more vehicles or more delivery vehicles can make their deliveries at the time they want and when they expect to. That is likely to lead to a reduced number of vehicles parking in places which are not very helpful to the wider road network and also to reduce the number of vehicles that have to drive around, circulate, looking for spots, parking elsewhere, which leads to more kilometres travelled on the road network and also um, a wider impact of, because of those extra kilometres uh, as they move around and interfere with uh, the operation of the wider road network. So in, in, in going through that appraisal process, we looked at uh, sort of think, looking at the infographics that are, are on, on the screen, sort of top left. So clearly by making uh, the, the loading base bookable, it means there's more chance of the uh, delivery operator being able to make that delivery right outside the shop or the facility where they want to go at the right time. And that means that they're spending less time um, looking for the right spot or having to park nearby and spend more time uh, wheeling goods to the to location. And that's actually a key benefit to the operator. There's also those wider benefits that because those vehicles aren't are actually able to do what they want, they're not driving around, um, as you can see, emitting more uh, carbon dioxide from their vehicles, and they're not or they're also not uh, affecting the traffic flow on the local roads. And as part of our assessment, we sort of looked at some sort of general locations where we thought this might happen and think that well if someone can't park or loads where they want to, they might have to drive around for five or 10 minutes um, to find a location where they want or to wait until the space becomes free so they can actually make that delivery. And that has uh, an impact on the traffic flows. And we've assessed and made some assessments of how that might change the kilometers traveled on the network, which has consequent benefits for that road network, but also benefits, as I said, in terms of reduced emissions, both of carbon dioxide and particulates and, and other issues. But a key point as well is, as you can see on the, the picture, the, the way that loading often happens because it, it's a, an uncoordinated uh, system at the moment is that all those uh, deliveries, if, if they aren't able to access the right loading space, can have an impact on pedestrian routes, on, on by parking in um, inconvenient places for pedestrians and cyclists. 
And again, through the DFT's uh, approach to appraisal, we're able to look at how removing those challenges to pedestrians and cyclists have actual benefits which we can look at and try and quantify. And by improving the environment for pedestrians and cyclists as well, that can have health benefits. And it also leads, looking around the images to the bottom left, to actually a better environment in the town centre. And again, a key point for me is that in the same way that parking has been managed over the decades to ensure that parking uh, happens in a safe and considered way around our, our towns and cities, you know, the same thing needs to happen with loading to help improve the environment and the urban environment. So uh, areas aren't dominated by vans parking in, in places which aren't very helpful and helps help with the all those issues around trying to keep town centres vibrant and um, and have a good level of vitality. And perhaps just to think about this is actually again in terms of thinking about the, the appraisal guidance, you know, many of you be, many of you will be familiar with that of key, key things around the costs and the benefits. It's actually a very low cost scheme to implement. It is a software based product uh, essentially and um, there's costs to, to do that but they're actually relatively low but the actual benefits are actually very high. So in terms of you know your benefit cost ratio you're getting lots of benefits for a very small uh, input of capital and as Neil said there's also a revenue stream there for the curb owners i.e the highway authorities who would have to operate the scheme which again is helpful to help with uh, funding other other schemes potentially so if we just go on to the next slide please um, in doing that appraisal we made some uh, assumptions and thoughts about how curb would benefit the operation of, of the road network and the the urban environment in and around uh, loading bays and key figures that come out is because of those reduced kilometers that are traveled because uh, delivery vehicles are not having to circulate around or park in places where they don't want to those reduced kilometers do continue to lead to reduce in uh, emissions in carbon dioxide because clearly at the moment not all um, vehicles are, are, are electric and uh, you can see there's 15,000 tonnes of reduced carbon dioxide, which is which is a, is a good number, and compared to other large schemes like ULES across London. So I should say these numbers are, are for London um, and for the curb benefits to be implemented across London. And you see there's an equivalence about uh, removing the cars off the road. And again, in the revenues, by I think uh, my notes, I think 6,000 potential bays across London where this could be um, implemented, and you know, with the, the financial structure that Neil's uh, proposing, that actually generates a lot of revenue, which can be used to, to manage the system and to help um, uh, fund traffic enforcement officers who would then be able to focus on other areas of, of challenge in, in the network and also support and provide an income for, for the, um, the curb owners. And uh, as, as Neil is talking to, as well as those benefits to the wider society, which I think are actually very big in terms of better management and a better urban environment, benefits to pedestrian cyclists through the better management of vehicles on the road and moving around the road network. So all those benefits for the curb users, i.e. the delivery companies, because they're able to have a much better reliability of being able to deliver when they want and where they want, they're going to reduce the number of hours that they uh, ex um, waste, waiting to get that slot that they need. And that's, as you would expect, over London and all the deliveries that happen in London, that adds up to a, to a big number. And that better efficiency of, um, again, being able to deliver what, when they want and, and where they want means that they're able to squeeze in more deliveries per day, which makes them more efficient. And again, helps um, support the financial viability of, of, of those companies. And again, it's all about a more efficient network helps reduce the kilometers that they're travel, traveling around the network. And again, over all of London, it's actually a big reduction. And again, by taking those kilometres off the road, just help um, reduce the demand to use that road network and helps contribute to those you know, wider aspirations of improving the urban environment. So, so that in a nutshell is how we've used the transport appraisal guidance produced by the DFT to assess these curb products. And clearly there are some very, very large benefits uh, which can be uh, obtained both for the curb operators and, and the operators of de uh, delivery networks, but also that wider community of people who live and work and uh, use the urban environments where loading uh, takes place. So that's uh, my, my brief summary. I'm now going to hand you on to hand you over to John Crosk of the Brewery Logistics Group. 
Thanks, David. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is John Crosco. I'm Vice Chairman of the Rural Logistics Group. I also manage the uh, Central London Freight Quality Partnership um, for Central London. Um, I'll be talking predominantly about London uh, today and about the challenges that our members face on a day-to-day, -day, the real challenges our members face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so as we see on the next slide, um, some background to the Rural Logistics Group. The Rural Logistics Group is a trade association and we represent the key logistic companies servicing the pubs, clubs, restaurants and bars in London. Um, we currently represent 15 members who cover over a thousand trips a day into London and we account for approximately 75% of all the beer deliveries inside the M25. And as we see on the next slide, um, health and safety in our industry is, is all important. The brewing industry is subject to extensive health and safety regulations and the HSC accept that deliveries collections are essential to the brewing industry and to the businesses that we supply. But they also determine that the delivering beer can be the most dangerous of activities at the curbside for both employers and members of the public if the strict guidelines are not followed. And uh, every delivery point before its first delivery must be assessed and documented uh, and often the safe, safest time for a delivery and uh, it, it puts the operator at odds with parking restrictions and in some cases um, with res residents due to noise um, issues. An empty keg, for instance, is like a bell and, and, and can be very noisy. Uh, the, the, the health and safety executive are extremely interested in all elements of our delivery procedure, such as manual handling, power operated equipment, set, cellar hoist below ground, working at high and load security. So moving on to the next slide, we look at what's currently happening at, the, at our curbside. So London requires 400,000 tonnes of goods uh, daily to resupply the capital, and 99% of all those goods are delivered via the curbside. Currently, operators work on the basis that there's a purpose, a route, and a destination for our vehicles. But after that, there's no control over the congestion or access to the curbside at any given time. And it's fair to argue, really, that London promotes a free-for-all policy. There is no plan. Redelivery is common due to access issues at the curbside and, as a result, delivery failures. Um, congestion and extended dwell times at the curbside are forcing operators to increase their fleet sizes and to, to make up for the loss in productivity. And there's a new catchphrase in, in London, and it's, called, it's rework. Um, that's basically what fouls today gets replanned tomorrow. Um, in my times in operation, I, I, I never knew that phrase, but uh, as I've been made aware of that. So looking at the next slide, the curbside is changing with the emphasis placed on walking and cycling. And, and to accommodate this, uh, footpaths are being widened, cycle lanes installed and loading bays removed completely in some cases as we've found and all manner of restrictions for access are being implemented. Freight operators have been lost in any of the planning conversations and there appears to be no fault as to how, to, as how deliveries fit into the coexistence of all the groups that need to use this same valuable space. And we're seeing in our industry now that operators, when being invited to tender for de uh, brewery distribution contracts, that they're declining the offer as it's too expensive to run a London operation uh, and they effectively can't make a profit. And we're also seeing recently that some of our overseas partners are now refusing to come into central London uh, and into the capital. To uh, Basically, they want to cross dock in places like Kent. Rather, that, rather than bring their vehicles in. So on the next slide, we see that the brewing industry is a unique sector and it has a, a crucial needs when delivering to public houses. The HSE dictate that on the grounds of health and safety, that deliveries must be made adjacent to the delivery point. That often puts our members in conflict with um, roadside restrictions, such as parking, parking regulations, there is some recognition, however, from some of the London boroughs and Transport for London um, that we we have special health and safety needs and they allow us to park without penalty at the curbside. But not all London boroughs follow suit uh, and, and 
we're you know we're effectively there the same time uh, week in week out and we're sitting up for for PCNs. All pub delivery locations, as I mentioned before, must be risk assessed prior to first delivery, and that assessment will determine the safest time of day and delivery. Uh, uh, sorry, the safest time of day a delivery can be made, uh, and that considers all parties who use the curbside. Use the curbside. Uh, an illustration of that on the next page. Sorry, on the next slide, even. Um, because we need to deliver across uh, cycle lanes, we have a code of practice, which has been in place uh, since 2015. And in short, we don't deliver during the peak um, times. We deliver at the times when the cycle lanes are, are, are practically empty. We do close the cycle lanes. So if it's a two metre cycle lane, we fully close it for the duration. Uh, of the delivery and we use the signage that's provided by Transport for London to the pubs. Um, if it's a four metre lane, for instance, we will only park close that uh, and we will still use that signage to inform the cyclists that um, there is a, a delivery in progress, um, but, but also to make a safe haven really for the delivery crews as well. And on my final side, looking at um, deliveries, the real impact of changes to access to the curbside has been felt by our members uh, and we've recently faced issues uh, of having to refuse deliveries to some pubs on the ground of health and safety due to the streets based changes in London where the delivery has now been assessed as too dangerous to allow container beer to be delivered. It's always the case that if there's not adequate and safe provision to deliver that we will take the option to foul the delivery and refuse the, refuse the public delivery. The fact that other operators who have been invited to break the law, whether that be the more serious criminal health and safety breach under one or more of the Management of Health and Safety Legislation Acts, in that they are having to chance people's safety, our industry is not prepared to endanger harm in any individual and face prosecution. I recently witnessed a, a pallet of um, bricks being delivered across the cycle lane I won't mention the company, obviously, uh, but they were moving the bricks across the cycle lane by high app with cyclists um, going underneath. Um, that wouldn't be our job. I mean, that's why we have a code of practice to close the, the cycle lanes to stop that, such dangerous practices. So on the next slides, some solutions. We believe that a full review of the curbside and its future use should be high on the agenda to future-proof our towns and cities with the aim of finding a workable solution to the current is uh, access issues. Delivery and servicing plans should be adapted to take into consideration access and business need. Perhaps there needs to be a DSP for every street where deliveries take place. There needs to be engagement with all parties that require access to the curbside, not only focusing on walking and cycling, as important as that is, but all stakeholders where it works for the benefit and safety for all. Instead of this daily free-for-all where vehicles hope to find a space to stop and then when they can't, they just drive around and, until they, uh, a space appears, let's look at what technology offers in terms of finding a, a solution. And the next slide, please. The BLG is keen to work with all companies that are looking for solutions, trade associations, and councils to explore ideas to find the solution to our industry's particular health and safety need to park adjacent to the delivery point. Full consolidation of customers, or Neil uh, picked up on this, but a full consolidation of customers orders on one vehicle that will put the vehicle at the curbside longer, yes, but will remove the need for additional vehicle movements. If you think about what we've been doing in our industry, a pub, a pub received deliveries on eight separate vehicles. They got a beer delivery, they got a wines and spirits delivery, they got a minerals delivery, got CO2 delivery, a food delivery. Well, that's two deliveries now. You get everything on the the, the dray, the beer dray, and then the food delivery uh, comes to it. We also reverse, um, in terms of reverse logistics, we pick up the empties, we pick up waste, we pick up you know, cooking oil, for instance. 
So we are looking to do our best to try and review, reduce the amount of vehicles that we're putting on the road. But we need to find a different solution to lazy planning. And my example of that is going to be around the electric charging points, because my best guess is they're going to go curbside. And because that that that's the easy option. But I think we need to look at a different way and we need, need to look at what we put at the curbside, you know, um, and, and analyze what the impact will be. Uh, and that's regard, that could be a bollard, you know, uh, uh, anything, a piece of furniture that goes curbside. We need, we need to look at it. And on my, on my next slide, picking up on that last point, we need to think of the unintended consequences of the changes to the curbside. Most of the recent changes would have had the effect uh, on operators of, of them having to employ more vehicles to make up for the loss in productivity. As some, uh, something no operator wants to do is increase emissions, costs and risk. And we need to stop removing loading bays. A delivery needs to be made safely and legally. Removing bays doesn't stop a business needing goods. Another effect we need to keep in mind is that the population growth in London is predicted to be 10% in the next five years. And for me, that equates to another 40,000 tonnes of curbside deliveries daily. Perhaps we need to ask Londoners and anyone else that take in, in cities what their views are, because after all, 400,000 tonnes is driven by them. Yeah. And the last thing I'd like to say is, so, well, you can't have a pub with no beer. It's, it's not acceptable. And, and I would like to now, now pass, pass on to Natalie Chapman from Logistics UK. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. And um, so just to follow on from John, um, I actually don't have any slides uh, this morning. I'm just going to talk to you uh, through a few points. Uh, first of all, um, introducing Logistics UK, um, explain kind of who we are and what we do, and some of our policy campaign priorities, and um, our challenges at the curbside, um, and more generally, uh, delivering and servicing towns and cities across the UK. And so for those that aren't familiar with Logistics UK, uh, we were formerly known as the Freight Transport Association. Uh, we renamed last year to better reflect the fact that we represent all of logistics. Um, we represent the UK supply chain, so that's road, rail, sea, air, and buyers of transport as well. Um, I know there's lots of local authorities uh, listening in on, on today's webinar, and we have lots of boroughs um, and local authorities in membership as well, because you operate all sorts of interesting uh, vehicles. And we're also really interested in land use planning, um, because actually logistics isn't just about transport, we're, we're a system. And we need to make sure we have the right land planning policy to enable us to uh, to site ourselves in the right locations. If we are particularly if we are going to achieve our decarbonisation targets, if we're going to shift to net zero uh, to, to zero emission vehicles, we need to make sure we have uh, the warehousing space in the right strategic location. And just pushing things further and further out from our cities increases that STEM mileage. So that's hugely important to us as well. Um, we have just over 18,000 members in the UK um, and looking at road um, specifically, um, those members operate about 200,000 HGVs, which is around half of the UK fleet and around a third of the 4.6 million vans on the road as well. So our, what's keeping us busy at the moment at Logistics UK, our key campaign priorities, unsurprisingly, uh, number one is skills and particularly the HGV driver shortage, which we're all hearing an awful lot of, about in the media. Um, this week we launched our 2021 skills report um, and if you want to view that along with a, a business edit about it which is sort of the executive summary uh, you can download that from our website if you go to logistics.org.uk forward slash skills. Um, right now our members are really really busy delivering Christmas um, but we're facing some global supply chain challenges We've seen a huge rise in the cost of uh, container shipping prices over the last 18 months. We're seeing congestion at ports globally um, and some retailers now chartering their own cargo ships to ensure that they've got uh, that supply chain security. And some of these have switched some lines to, to air freight, particularly uh, the high value must have Christmas gifts 
that have to arrive uh, you know, in time for inside for Santa to deliver them. Uh, they've actually just shifted to, to some of those have shifted to air cargo just to have that, that security that they will arrive. We're also facing some real challenges around um, vehicle supply issues. Um, this is primarily down to the global um, semiconductor supply shortage, which is affecting the whole of the automotive industry. Uh, we're now seeing lead times for HGVs. If you place an order now, you probably won't see that vehicle on the road until 2023. And that's posing us some real issues with um, compliance with schemes such as the low emission zone, ULEZ, clean air zones across the country, uh, and the direct vision standard uh, in London. And then also our other big priority as well, uh, not just right now, but I think it's going to be continued for some period of time, is net zero. And uh, we launched our route to net zero manifesto at COP26. Um, the industry is absolutely committed to decarbonisation. Uh, but with road freight, there are some real challenges that remain, uh, particularly around the technology for larger HGVs and the refuelling and recharging infrastructure that goes with them. But looking um, specifically at the challenges that we face in towns and cities, um, I think uh, we've heard um, uh, from uh, from John and from Neil some of the some of outlining some of the real kind of challenges we face. Primarily, curbside access for loading and unloading, uh, those competing needs. Um, I know it's a real challenge for local authority transport planners with so many different and competing demands at the curb space. Trying to keep everyone happy is, um, I think, a, a thankless task. But we are also seeing diminishing loading space with so many competing needs at the curbside, and that is resulting in uh, increases in PCNs. Um, and the second biggest challenge really as well is around journey times and journey time reliability. Um, INRIC's report uh, published a report this week which now ranks London as the most congested city in the world, um, with drivers losing an average of 148 hours sitting in traffic each year. Now, it costs a pound a minute to operate an HGV, so quite quickly you can work out those, those, those costs of congestion are really, really significant to the logistics industry. And we're an industry that operates on really tight margins, margins of 1% and 2%. So those have um, big impacts on, uh, on, on the bottom line for our industry as well. But they also have a huge impact on emissions and air quality too. The other impact of congestion is that if it takes longer to develop to deliver the same amount of product john talked about the london example of four four hundred thousand tons a day um and we can scale that and work that out what that would be for other towns and cities as well we have that amount of product to deliver because people are demanding it um it if it takes longer to deliver that amount of product particularly with things like fixed shifts such as eu drivers hours um, rules for hgv drivers what we do is we end up putting more vehicles on the road, further adding to congestion, emissions, and of course, increasing costs as well. And um, also John touched on uh, reallocation of, of road space. Um, we've seen an awful lot of new um, schemes coming in to enable more active travel, more walking and more cycling, um, particularly over the last 18 months. And the first thing I'd say is Logistics UK absolutely supports uh, enabling more active travel, more walking and more cycling. But what we need to do is ensure that new infrastructure schemes uh, take a holistic approach and consider the needs of and the impact on road freight. And this includes not only uh, access to curbside deliveries, but also the impact on journey times and journey, journey time reliability as well. The other thing is about ensuring that the curbside access we have is appropriate for deliveries generated in a particular area. So we need to think about the size of loading bays. Can they accommodate you know, the, the size of vehicles that we need? Because if we artificially squeeze those down, what we don't want to have is smaller vehicles, but many, many more of them because we need more of them to carry the same amount of payload. Um, we need to be thinking about the location of loading facilities. You know, where are they in proximity to where the delivery point is, uh, the recipient of the goods, particularly uh, where there are health and safety issues as well. Um, we also need to make sure we allow enough time for loading and unloading. You know, many deliveries can't be made in 20 minutes or indeed even 40 minutes. You know, the, the brewery deliveries to pubs, they take a significant amount of time. Supermarket deliveries, if you're using a tail, uh, um, a tail lift to uh, bring um, uh, roll cages uh, off the vehicle and then move the empty roll cages back onto the vehicle, all of that can take significant amounts of time as well. Um, we need to ensure 
that deliveries can be made safely and longer dwell times may actually allow for fewer, fewer vehicle movements. So the question I guess that we're looking at today is, is bookable curb space the answer? Um, and I think what, what we would say at Logistics UK and talking to our members is um, there is certainly a place for this in the mix of solutions. There is no silver bullet about how we solve all of the issues of um, delivering into towns and cities. Um, I think where it particularly has a role is a way in providing an electronic dispensation. So brewery deliveries, for example, which have very specific health and safety requirements where the vehicles may need to stop where loading or loading or parking may not otherwise be allowed. Um, I think there is certainly a role for that. Um, the same perhaps goes for things like scaffolders and glazes. They have to stop where they have to stop because of very specific health and safety issues that they have. But what we wouldn't want to see is it as a prerequisite for other deliveries. It has the potential to add admin and cost up front, uh, which adds another layer of complexity into delivering to our towns and cities. We're also really concerned about fragmentation of regulation. You know, many of our members will operate across the UK and have different rules and different systems for operating to different towns and cities. That becomes um, a logistical nightmare. Um, and if we look at London, and I know there's many local authorities here that are listening from other parts of the country, but we're always referring to London as kind of the worst case scenario because it is the most complex um, environment to deliver in. Um, it has the most complicated regulatory environment. We're now starting to hear anecdotally of some companies refusing to deliver in. Um, there's one, for example, a construction consolidation centre, which the Mayor's Transport Strategy is trying to encourage. They are really struggling to get materials delivered in, particularly from non-UK suppliers. That's not a, you know, a Brexit customs issue specifically. It's actually they, they will drop, but they just don't want to come into London because there are so many rules and regulations and the final straw for many of them was the direct vision standard, which was introduced earlier this year. Again, something we absolutely you know, support measures to improve safety on our roads. Um, but if you don't meet the minimum one star rating for direct vision, then it's, um, it adds uh, another uh, thousand to 1500 pounds per vehicle of all the equipment that needs to be retrofitted. And some are just saying, I'm not gonna do that. Um, so it starts to make uh, some of our cities are competitive, it starts to push up the costs of deliveries. So I think whilst we may have this idea of what our utopia will be, we need to also think what are those potential unintended consequences. And um, But what I do think is, is really important, in, and, and just to finish off here, is that it's really important to better understand the demand and usage of the curbside. Um, and technology such as loading base centres actually have a really great role to play here. Our high streets are constantly changing. We've seen banks that are turning into pubs, pubs turning into supermarket convenience stores. All of their delivery needs are different. Um, and we really should be looking at, you know, reviews of our high street locations, you know, say every five years. If there's a new development, that should also trigger a review of the signs and lines so that we can make sure um, that, that, uh, that our access to the curbside you know, fully meets the demands um, uh, that our, our current high streets are, are, are putting on them. So I'm going to pause there and look forward to the questions uh, in a moment. And in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to Farah. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, I'm Farah Asemi, and I'm the founder and CEO of EcoFleet Mindful Delivery. Uh, we started uh, operating in London, <clears throat> Southwest London in Battersea in September 2019. And uh, before starting, uh, we applied for a grant from the Energy Savings Trust, and we were given a grant for 20 uh, electric cargo bikes. Um, I was surprised and absolutely delighted, but it gave me the strength beneath my wings to say this is something that the government believes in, they are willing to give us the grant, this is the future, and it kind of uh, propelled me to do uh, what I wanted to do in setting up this cargo bike uh, company. I felt it was the future. And um, so we came down to Battersea where we have a warehouse. Uh, we got a grant for the 20 bikes. We've purchased our uh, seven bikes of our own. And also we've now applied for another uh, grant from the Energy Savings Trust, and we've been given that too for five bikes. 
So I feel we are in a very good position to continue as a logistics company uh, doing uh, cargo bike deliveries. And um, why did I do uh, uh, EcoFleet? Uh, why did I start EcoFleet? Well, it was partly a personal uh, reason. Um, uh, I had lung damage due to having a um, diesel car um, and been working in design industry for years, happy as a clam, but I felt, um, you know, I'm older, I'm wiser. If people like me don't want to help make a change, then how can change happen? So I came into logistics as a woman. There's not very many of us, and certainly there's only two cargo bike operators um, with women founders. And um, it's been great. I've had um, great experience so far. I've had the support of uh, a crossover partnership and um, other organizations such as that. Uh, I also mentioned the grant and we started working and I remember before the pandemic it was extremely difficult to convince people of uh, changing from car deliveries to cargo bike deliveries. First of all there was a lot of decoding to do. Last mile of uh, emission free cargo bike delivery. I mean, I really had to decode it for them and show them pictures and take the bike over and see what it could do. And people were not convinced, but I think the pandemic as awful as it was, it really highlighted um, the logistics part of deliveries and people wanting more and more deliveries. And I reckon uh, by 2030, this the numbers will increase even more. Uh, so I no longer have to explain what I do or what the bike is or what it is capable of doing. I think there's many operators uh, since the pandemic, and I see more and more uh, new uh, cargo bikes with different branding on the roads in London. And with uh, the government giving businesses grants uh, themselves, businesses are now buying their own cargo bikes and doing their own deliveries, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, so that's a little bit of background about us. Um, there's 32 of us at uh, EcoFleet right now. And um, what we do here is we take overnight deliveries uh, for some of our clients um, and we store them in the morning. The riders come, they uh, work from our software, which is very similar to what a van logistic company would have. And off they go, they pick and pack, and they go to their different uh, locations and destinations in London. Um, we go as far as zone three um, for certain clients, even though it's on a bike, but if we have enough work to do in zone three, then we go there. Um, and we also have a warehouse large enough where we store, pick and pack, and um, kind of consolidate for uh, companies that are outside of London and want to have their goods inside London and delivered by cargo bikes. I would say uh, that more and more people, uh, clients are coming to us because of the traffic problem. Um, people talk the talk of sustainability and wanting to help reduce emissions, but when it gets down to nitty gritty, I think they find it hard to pay a cargo bike company the same as a van logistics cargo um, company and we often lose the client because of you know their numbers not working or just not coming to an agreement but the clients that do sign up with us are very interested because we beat the traffic and they need to get their cheese to canary wharf by lunchtime there is no way that somebody could do that in london and come back and not lose one of their staff for two and a half, three hours. And then once they get to Canary Wharf, um, you know, as well as I do, you have to have your car registered and delivery is almost um, very difficult. Uh, you'd have to go into a parking space, park, go and deliver your cheese. So more and more people are coming to us for a traffic solution um, and not necessarily the CO2 solution. Um, next slide, please. Um, we are not uh, Deliveroo and we are not Uber. Uh, we have, I'm sure you're, uh, you've seen cargo bikes. We have a trunk at the 
front of our bike that's got a lock and it can carry 623 liters up to about 120 kg. And um, I understand that DHL and FedEx and DPD have now also bought their own fleet of electric cargo bikes, whereas they were predominantly van deliveries and many of them uh, have been fortunate and they've changed into electric cars, but that still doesn't solve the problem of traffic. So many are opting to have electric cargo bikes. Um, but we are a logistics company, I would say, and we have the same expenses and we have the same knowledge. Um, you know, we don't have expenses such as parking tickets, but our repair tickets for our bikes are quite costly. Uh, and so those are real expenses. We pay our employees the same way as most big companies do. All their NI, everything is included. So um, we have to make our balance sheets work. Next slide, please. Um, we have wonderful competitors, but I would also call them my collaborators. I know the owners of most of the competitors. And I often say, you know, in comparison to some of the big ones, we're still toddlers and we have a lot to learn from some of our um, bigger competitions. Um, but they've accepted us and um, we try not to go after each other's clients, but, um, there's room in this town for many more operators to set up and start and do more bike deliveries. The government has paid for these amazing uh, kilometers and kilometers of cycle lanes, and it would be silly not to use them if you could have a cargo bike delivery. So um, uh, there's room for all of us. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so, what are some of our challenges? Staffing, um, you know, uh, like with any other company, if you have one staff not show up, it's it's pretty awful. But if you have four sick people, then it's almost uh, um, it's almost impossible to run the day. So we have staffing issues, like all other companies. Um, scaling issues. Obviously, we're in Southwest London, and that's a wonderful place to be. But London, as you know, is such a beautiful, big, amazing city. Um, and for us to scale, we would need to be in East London. We would need to be in West London, um, just so we can spread our wings and have more clients and have more local deliveries to those areas. We have a lot of South London deliveries, but as I said before, if a client has enough volume, we also go to different parts of London to do those big deliveries. Um, and pricing, I would say that that's also a challenge. Uh, I think I mentioned it before. Um, we have the same expenses as all other companies. So just because it's on a bike, I can't say, oh, well, I'll charge you less because I'm on a push bike. And no, I have the same expenses. So. Um, I think you can be sustainable and make money so that you can, you know, give better salaries to your staff and pay your expenses. Next slide, please. Um, I think um, some of the people that spoke before me may have touched upon these things, uh, these points, but, um, you know, 6.9 billion uh, pounds was lost due to traffic jams in 2019 and all the cycle lanes that have been, uh, cycle paths that, that have been built in London, 260 kilometers, which is astounding and absolutely wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, just the congestion ULIS uh, charges. We had one client who um, was having to pay 3,000 pounds a month uh, for uh, parking tickets. Um, and then they then had to employ another person to sit in the van with the driver so that one person could drive and park and the other person could do the deliveries. But obviously, then you have another salary to do for just doing deliveries. And, um, you know, the government wanting to achieve a net zero by 2050. These are all absolutely wonderful ambitions. And I know that UK is leading in all of this and we can all together achieve it. Um, we just need some planning and uh, curbside uh, management to help us get there. And this is why I decided to participate on this panel today, because I actually do believe that this is a great 
offering and it would help us all um, resolve some of the issues. Now, how would it resolve an issue for a cargo bike operator? Um, I'm gonna give you one example of a delivery made about a year ago um, in Barbican. I had a one person uh, who lives in the Barbican call me and complain that my rider had tried to enter the Barbican. I called up the rider and said, did you know you're not allowed to take the bike into the Barbican? Please put it outside. He then parked the car, the, the bike on the curbside outside of Barbican. I then had another person, a member of the public to call me and say, why is your bike parked on the pedestrian sidewalk? So uh, you're not allowed to do that. Um, and it was, I, I lost a rider for I think an hour and 20 minutes that day. As you know, Barbican is huge, making a delivery for four pounds and losing a rider for an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes is quite um, a lot. And um, it made me think there's gotta be a better way of having a curbside to be able to safely park your bike and deliver. Um, so I, I, think, I think we're onto a good thing here. Next slide, please. Um, just again, uh, you got, you're all aware of the environmental uh, impact of this and what we can do uh, as a cargo bike operator. We have zero CO2 and we're helping all these uh, companies to reduce theirs. So I think that speaks for itself. Um, next slide, please. Um, yes, I believe that we are a solution to logistics in London. Uh, London being one of the biggest cities and the most problematic in terms of logistics and traffic, I think cargo bikes are here to stay. Um, I believe the government has faith in us and um, I'm, I'm proud and happy to be serving as a cargo bike operator. Next slide, please. That's it, I'm done. Thank you for your time and for listening to me. Thank you, Farah, and thank you all. What a, what a set of speakers and what a pile of information they gave us. You'll all have made your own notes, and as they gather together, I'll run you through mine. Neil is a technical entrepreneur from the Northeast. Obviously, there was a lot of heavy tech in there, but all with practical applications, and I'm, I'm sure Neil would tell us it can all work in the ground. Dave described the curbside as a scarce resource. He said time is money and it's simply is pollution. And that was echoed later on as well. John came in as a, as a practitioner and, and gave us some ideas about the scale of the issue. Described London as a free-for-all, and I don't know if other cities are, are much better. And they gave me a new word, rework, rework. Again, time is money. Sending something twice costs twice as much as sending it once at least. And then Natalie. Uh, lifted us up a scale and told us of the problem facing the industry and brought us into net zero and decarbonisation and gave us some facts on journey time. Pound a minute. So that lorry's going round and round. It's costing a pound a minute to do that. And then Farah gave us really <coughs> a new kind of logistics, the last mile emission free. So all good stuff. And thank you all. And, and you'll see that later on when the when the whole seminar goes up on the, the, the YouTube channel. And thank you all for your questions too, although some of the questions that came in early were actually picked up by the presenters as they went along. So I'll, I'll kind of summarise rather than naming people and, and saying what you asked. I'll do the easy ones first. Somebody asked if the Brewery Logistics Group was only London. And of course they're not, they're, they're countrywide and they're strong in the Midlands. Why would they not be with the breweries that we have in the, in the Midlands? There's also specific for Farah. How much can you put in a cargo bike? Is there a payload limit to it? Uh, yes, uh, there. we usually load up to about 120 kilos. That would be a very heavy load for us. So we try yep. to come under that. Uh, but 623 liters, uh, which is equivalent to eight uh, box files um, or 102 yep. Yep. wine bottles. Yeah, and I'll, I'll get John to help you with the next question. How many kegs of beer would you send in a cargo bike, John? Or do you think that was that would be too much of a risk? Another, another more, Jen. Yeah, carry on, John. 
No, I was just going to say, I, I, I saw that uh, there's a particular operator in London who is attempting to deliver to deliver kegs on a cargo bike, um, which filled me with horror, given that there are rules around transporting yeah. container beer by, by road, um, that they have to be restrained, and these had a couple of bungee straps around them, and uh, yeah, yeah. I was sort of um, ended up holding my head in, in my hands. Yeah. yeah. And, and the the just a general question. Yeah, the temptation for people to treat it like an ice cream trolley and stop me and buy one, so you can fit a hand pump to the top of that and serve me as you go along, especially on a hot day. <laughs> Another question that came up early, but I think it was picked up in the in the general chat, was cycle lanes. What's the impact on cycle of cycle lanes on this scarce resource that is the curbside? Does anyone want to add what was already been said on that? Well, from our point of view, I should have actually said that yeah, it, you did. The, the impact on us is that as, if you're delivering across a cycle lane, you know you're going to lose productivity because it can take up to 50% longer to deliver to the pub where you have to you, you have to close it if you close the cycle lane or you park close it. Um, you know, it, it takes an extraordinary amount of time to to set all that up before you even start the delivery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what that really emphasises is that we don't just send a lorry out and say, you've got a load of stuff in the back, see how you can get it into the premises on your list. These are all quite meticulously planned, including exactly what they do at the location. If there's a cycle lane, there's extra steps to be, to be taken. And somebody also put in the questions about one of the pictures has a, a lorry on the pavement. What about parking on pavements? What what happens there? I think you're just coming on this one, John. It was a recess. Yep, carry on, Neil. Technically, it wasn't on the pavement, and the pavement yep. debate is another one. But uh, what we're looking at is where John is with critical loads is looking to the local authorities to create their own permissions hierarchy at the curb space, where there are some curbside critical users, such as frozen and chilled goods or brew logistics, there needs to be a way to manage those with a digital dispensation or waiver that can work with the operators as well and work with other road users and curbside users. Now, why we, why we look at the floor, Neil, there's technical questions in here about the designation <clears> of your <throat> bays and how can you stop uh, rogue drivers going in them and that kind of thing. Can you nail all that down? Yeah, uh, what, what we're looking at is the, the system that we've built or we're building at the moment can work with the current traffic regulation orders and uh, road traffic regulations and traffic management acts uh, per se. And what we're looking at is creating uh, order required uh, dispensations so you can create a new traffic order to allow a permit bay to be a permit bay where loading is by digital permit or within the dispensations and waivers that exist in the current schedules. And so we can add in a permissions protocol, permissions uh, it was a dispensation protocol. Excuse me. And if we're looking at how we manage the curb space, all local authorities have underlying traffic orders, and we are progressing towards the digitization of those traffic orders. And if we're looking at a digitized curb space and connected and autonomous vehicles, ultimately, 5, 10, 15 years down the line, you're going to have a connected vehicle talking to a digitized curb space and managing its own bookings, which will integrate with journey time, route planning, delivery management. And so we have to anticipate what the future looks like, but we have to get to where we need to be. As Natalie points out, there is no silver bullet in this, and it's about allowing the local authorities to have what effectively is a toolkit of solutions <clears throat> that can be, can be adapted to local needs. Good. And again, to one of the points as well, with regard to a national strategy, it's, it's not going to be for the national fleet operators to want to work with local authorities on an individual basis with different schemes in an individual local authority area. This is create, creating one system of standards, one system of implementation protocols, but which can be adapted at a, at a very hyper local level if required. So up and down the country, authorities are declaring a climate emergency. To what extent do you think that the, the climate emergency is going to provide the impetus to make these changes that we need? Natalie, you, you were first, I think, to, to mainline on it. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a lot of focus obviously on vehicle technology, which I, I mentioned, and that's going to be one of the key ways in which we, we decarbonise. Um, but it's also around, you know, efficiencies, uh, reductions in journey times. If we can reduce the number of vehicle movements um, as well, that, that's really helpful. And that's, 
that's about making sure we have the right vehicle for the right job for the right location and there's a role in there sometimes sometimes the right vehicle for that job is the cargo bike in a dense urban area during the day sometimes the best vehicle is the largest fully laden nice quiet hgv um, uh, delivering in overnight when there are fewer other vehicles on the road so we can get that, that in and out much quicker so there's no there's no single solution to any of this i think as, as i point out and, and as neil has said um but you know decarbonization and and you know we've also got the air quality challenges in our cities as well um, we're seeing a number of cities implement clean air zones um, which logistics uk absolutely supports where th that's the only way in which we're going to be able to clean up the air quick enough providing of course the right um, support is available for, uh, for, for particularly those um, small businesses or operators of, of, of high value, low mileage vehicles, which are, are much more difficult to replace. But actually they will do, all that does is speed up the fleet replacement cycle. So we need to think about the, the other things. And, and generally it's around tackling congestion, looking at road layouts, um, junction design, enabling deliveries to be retimed. All of those things that that package of measures will help us get onto that net zero journey. Yeah, good. So it's horses for courses, although I don't see anyone proposing bringing back the horse. Although maybe in some <laughs> of our medieval times it would be a donkey run, a car cargo bike would take it up those steep, steep hills. And you've talked, Natalie, about the the right vehicle in the right place, which kind of brings us around to the question of hubs. Should the hubs be outside the town, inside the town? Could we use the waterways to support the, the infrastructure? Who, who's, who's wants to talk about hubs? Is that one for John or one for David from an academic point? I'm happy to, to follow on as well on that one, because I think, again, yeah. it's about the right solution um, for the right location. And the, the challenge there is also making sure we can get the business case to work. So. Right, we're going to introduce a consolidation centre for a town. Who pays for that? How is it funded? Um, that that quite often is the challenge. But what we're also seeing is a massive amount of consolidation going on within the supply chain. So there's consolidation centres, you know, sheds, effectively, and it's also just general consolidation, which John talked about. So rather than sending in several vehicles into one pub to make all the different deliveries, they're consolidating. Um, all those different uh, elements onto one vehicle, that is consolidation as well. But we're also seeing um, lots of our members, particularly in the express car parcel side, look at micro consolidation. So they're looking at, they need small areas in you know, town and city centres to operate out cargo bikes, EVs. Um, and so they will bring in one larger vehicle, hopefully overnight, nice and quiet, and then use that to distribute, the, uh, distribute their goods from but, and, and, but it's a change in the business model. So it's not something you just you know, switch on overnight. It's got to be planned for. And we need to make sure we have the land safeguarded in the right locations to enable that as well. So it's working with local authorities, working with landowners to try and identify those suitable pieces of land that work for that, that cross docking. Small so, areas so, for micro John. consolidation. Is that you yeah, yep. if I can just come in for, for two minutes on that one. Natalie made an important point. It's got to be establishing the commercial case for the operators as well, rather than just being an, an imposition of another charge. And when we did the pilot in Sunderland with a parcel operator, uh, we showed that, or that operator showed that it, it had a 21% 20, efficiency gain for from its operations, which meant that if they applied that to their the wider London fleet of two and a half thousand vehicles, you got a 20% efficiency gain across those vehicles which could re result in 500 vehicles being taken off the road or a more efficient operation making more money. And it's the beneficial outcomes and the win-wins for all of the stakeholders and the actors in the play that's important. Local authorities benefit, the, the commercial operators benefit, and the environment benefits as well. And looking at the micro consolidation, it makes uh, one of the questions was uh, around uh, an operator with multiple drops. If we're looking at operators with hundreds of drops, a parcel company will be delivering perhaps 150 to 200 parcels a day. We're looking at that vehicle and how that operational curbside behavior would, would be best impacted on its operations and the curbside as well. So a vehicle like that, parking up curbside and curbside where loading is allowed, we're allowed to dwell for 40 or 60 minutes to use that as a micro hub to facilitate onward delivery by a different method is important. And if you can be walking and delivering in a location, 
better than stopping and dropping and moving around and causing congestion. It's a better outcome for everybody else. Yeah. So we keep coming back to congestion and the environment. We don't have any local authorities on this panel, but it seems the local authorities have a, a large stake in this. Uh, I think I'll go right along the panel on this one. What could, what should local authorities be doing? And since Neil was last to talk, I'll, I'll start with Farrow. What can and should local authorities do to support the better use of the curbside? Hi. Um, I think if they had time zones for that we could deliver during uh, and make yep. those a little easier uh, for cargo bike users and um, we're a little bit more stringent with uh, people who broke those laws and just parked their car um, yep. to yep. you know penalize those a little bit more so it would leave the room for proper logistics operators. That would be a huge help. Um, and I think to look at the traffic patterns to see where are the biggest bottlenecks and to really identify those and to give more space for bigger lorry. So it's really safely done as opposed to just thinking about the traffic, but the safety aspect first. So. That's yeah. what I would. Good, good, good points there and echoes of what both John and, and Natalie said earlier. David, from a, a slightly more academic, uh, looking at the policies, what can local authorities do? What should they do? So I think just to pick on the, on the consolidation point, I think there's an element around the demand side. So lots of um, local authorities work with business improvement district, districts or groups of um, yep. organisations in town centres try and consolidate the demand. So rather than having 20 organizations that have got 20 different coffee deliveries or paper deliveries to, in a small area, is to get them to work together to try and reduce that, perhaps using an approved supplier list, to actually have just one or two organizations making those type of deliveries, those essentials, and that helps reduce the demand. Um, and I think also just thinking about, as you know, many councils will be looking at their town centers and how they can be uh, made vibrant and continue through all the other changes that are happening. Just think about how deliveries and logistics can support that and also yep. perhaps sometimes where all those lorries uh, and vans perhaps can detract from the attractiveness of an area and how making a better management of that through systems like Curb or through other management systems can actually be part of that overall management of the whole uh, town centre area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so look at all the suite of tools that are available to them and use them to manage their town centres. John, the practitioner, what you you engage with local authorities? What do they do well? Well, for, well firstly, I'd say, say, John, I think they need they need to look at the curbside as a workplace. Yeah, it's a place of work for 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 many of us, um, and and they need to understand what goes on at the curbside, and. And as I mentioned uh, when I was giving my presentation, just being lazy really about what we do at the curbside, what furniture we put at the curbside. Even if you're putting a bollard there and it's next to a pub, you would question, you should question why is that needed? What is it there for? What will the effect be? I don't think we look at the curbside in that way. I, th I think. It, it, it's it's late. I, I said it in my presentation that sometimes it's lazy, and and and, and I, I gave the example of the charging points. We know they're going to go curbside, but perhaps we should be going. Is there something? Is there some other way? Could we put them in car parks? Could we, you know, etc. Et it doesn't always have to be at the curbside. Yeah, good good points. Competing uses for the curbside and the infrastructure being planted there as well. Natalie, Natalie. Yeah, I think uh, I, th I think it's about taking a um, you know, a really holistic approach, um, and look, you know I, I don't envy the role that local authority transport planners have to make. You know, you're expected to kind of understand all the different demands, how everything works, um, and you know, and we find that actually, you know, the challenge is there isn't always a lot of expertise about freight and logistics and their needs within local authorities. Um, there's some great examples of, of authorities that, that really do get it and others that where perhaps, you know, walking and cycling are much further up on the political agenda and freight is an afterthought. But unless we plan this all properly, um, it just isn't going to work. And, you know, we saw an example of it 
last year with um, the, the the funding pot from government to introduce kind of more um, uh, space for for well a lot of it was to enable um, social distancing as the high street started to reopen as well as encouraging more active travel again something that Logistics UK absolutely supports. The challenge, of course, is that funding pot came with some really, really strict timescales of how that had to be implemented. And it gave literally no time for, for the usual levels of consultation and engagement. And I, I, we've seen, obviously, a lot of those schemes change. We're now seeing things go in that are much better thought out. Um, and consultation is really important, but quite often I would say consultation is a tick box exercise. It's part of the process. Right, we've got to do it. We've done that bit. Yeah, Actually, yeah. the bit that comes before that is engagement. Engage with your businesses, understand what is going on, talk to them. And you know what? They can come up with some great solutions because logistics is about finding solutions. And we will always find a solution. What we need to make sure is we don't end up finding kind of the unintended solution that we don't really want, which, you know, say yeah. my example of congestion is our unintended solution is we end up putting more vehicles on the road. Yeah. Great, great, great points, Natalie. And it's a, a fair point to say that some authorities lack expertise and knowledge in, in freight uh, issues, which is where the, the freight quality partnerships and I hope outside London, the combined authority mayors start to bring in the expertise so that they're properly managing. It's a bit unfair of me, of me to tackle local authorities like this, but as a former council parking manager myself, they do know the they do know their areas. They know every meter of their curbside. But there's so many things pulling at their sleeves, saying, "Do this for me, do this for me." We're button. In fact, we've we've crossed crossed the end time. So I'll go back to our, our, our lead speaker, who's Neil. What can local authorities do? And we'll we'll finish off with these words from Neil. Well, I think what's important, John, is that we used to be dealing with parking departments, but now we're being approached by the air quality teams and the transport planners. So it's about this interactive urban realm. And freight has always been put in the too difficult to do box because of its complexity. What we've tried to do is to understand the, the complexity, understand the granularity, understand what hyperlocal solutions could look like. And I think to leave with, I think it was Natalie who coined the phrase, you can't have a a cafe culture without the coffee and the croissants being able to be delivered. And it's important that we do look at this in the round, look at this holistically. And we've got the solutions toolkit now that local authorities can start to play with. And so it's a, it's a big challenge, but it's a one that we have to address because the issues of air quality and climate change are not gonna go away. Local authorities have to deal with them. They have to address them. And the impact and outcomes of, of children having increased amounts of asthma in central London and in city centers is, is too powerful to ignore. We have to act and we have to act now. Thank you, Neil, and thank you for drawing it back to health, to health and, and, and climate and the, the wider role of us all in, in ensuring a safe, clean and, and green country. And it's the deliveries coming in are essential to the sustainability of our town centres. So thank you, panellists. Thank you all for attending today. Don't forget, attendees, that it will be up on the on the, the Landor channel later today. Don't forget as well that uh, we have a sponsor, Grid, and we also have Landor who provided the, the seminar for us. I hope you get some good ideas from it, even if your if your question wasn't asked. And do feel you can get in touch with the panelists, get in touch with myself if there's anything you want to follow up on at all. Thank you all. <laughs>